Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. The trailers, Andy, um, I think, again, it's the usual drill. The Swedes uh, did it better than we did. Although it wasn't as good of a Swedish trailer. In fact, did you catch that <laughs> they were starting to pull some of the uh, the junk that the U.S. trailers do, where they've got the text <laughs> popping up on the screen, uh, yes. an, an attack to hide another. It's God. just like, oh no, they're going the down The lessons that same are road. going the wrong way. <laughs> no, you're going the wrong way. Oh yeah, oh. no, it was it was not great, but it was uh, it, it, you know it was a good trailer. I think which trailer would have gotten you into the theater more side by side? Which do you think you were? Well, I mean better? the thing the thing where the U.S. trailer succeeded as far as your question goes is, is that it was in English that, and you don't speak Swedish. Well, there's that. No, <laughs> it, it's really um, that the American trailer honestly does nothing to give you any sense of the story. At all. All yeah. it does is highlight, hey, the third chapter of the Millennium uh, series is finally coming to you. So come check it out. It's a global phenomenon. Yeah. And that's pretty much what it does. And so, again, like, I, like I've uh, reiterated in the past, that's, that alone would have drawn me in. Just saying, oh, hey, it's finally coming out. I can finally go see Hornet's Nest.
But as a standalone trailer, the Swedish trailer sets us right into the story. It sets us exactly where we are and tells us where where Lisbeth is. Well, that's because it's doing the job of what a trailer should do. <laughs> it's actually, <laughs> it's telling you about, it's, you know, here's a little taste of the story you're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> so Right. Yeah, you have an excellent so. point. <laughs> it's good it shows us it shows us all of the little elements of Lisbeth's story in this thing we see her arrested we see her incarcerated we see her exercising we see her hospitalized uh we get little remnants of the video of the rape scene from the first film uh it, it's all the stuff they're building the case i think very very well um to actually get us to want to see this third movie on its own merits i i actually think it's a it's a lovely it's a lovely piece of work. Yeah, in context of what they're doing here, I yeah. do agree. I think that uh, it's a it's a solid trailer that's telling the story. It's not maybe quite as hard hitting as the previous two, which uh, seemed a little more risque. Like they were, uh, you know, willing to kind of show you things that you wouldn't normally see in American trailers. Uh, I guess you would classify that as red band. Um, but yeah. um, but I don't know if you need to at this point. I think the story has been set up and the audience knows what they're getting. And here you kind of re- you get a sense of, OK, this is going to be the story about, you know, the conclusion of this chapter that we've been set up with Elizabeth and her father. What I, what I love the most about this trailer is the, the Swedish trailer is the very last clip from the film uh, over Teleborian's light words, Lisbeth Salander has her very own confused perception of the world. And it starts with the reverse shot, the follow shot, as she is in full uh, makeup with her hair in the mohawk and and it's we're following her down the, the tunnel and then it cuts to her face and you see just for a second, you see her in, in her full manifestation of a salander and i i adore that i think that is a very effective use to just give us that snapshot of of who she is who we've always known her to be but now we get to to see her uh, i thought that was very effective 100 percent. this year the unmissable final chapter of the most talked about cinematic event is finally here Based on the international bestseller by Stieg Larsson. The full-blown literary and movie phenomenon of the girl with the dragon tattoo will be concluded. This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson... Hey, hey, hey. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, it's round three, in which Lisbeth goes up against the world in director Daniel Alfredson's final millennium entry, The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app, or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And, special unscripted announcement, you can now officially find The Next Reel in Spotify. So for those who have asked... For those who have sent me email, we're in Spotify, so you should go uh, follow us there. And there was great rejoicing. Yay! And if you enjoy this show and you're interested in supporting our ongoing work investigating great film, please consider a regular donation through our Patreon page. You'll get to join in our back channel conversations on Slack. Who boy, has it been crazy this <laughs> uh, the past few days since uh, The Last Jedi came out. Get in oh, on dear. that conversation <laughs> over on Slack. <laughs> And, of course, you can listen to the members-only weekend show, The Saturday Matinee. Just head on over to patreon.com slash the next reel. Here's the thing, Andy, about this movie. It is, uh, it's, we watched, again, the extended edition of the final uh, in the series. It is very long, and... Uh, it rolls straight in from the last film. I mean, you really you don't even know that the last film ended if you're not careful, and you're in this movie. And then the first hour and a half happens, and oh my god, I was bored. I wasn't bored ever, really. I actually, I I moved through this pretty well, actually. I was kind of surprised. Um, because this is the one where I really, the only thing I remembered about this one was the fact that there was a trial. Like that was my memory of the third film was there was a trial. Yeah. And coming into this, I'm like, so we've got like a three hour trial that we're going to go through. <laughs> no, the trial is actually only a final portion of the, uh, of the second half. 
Um, there is a lot of other stuff going on. It's not boring. And I think, you know, for me, it's, um, it, I mean, it, I can totally see where you're coming from, but I think it was just because I was enjoying the characters and just kind of enjoying kind of the way that the, um, I guess you could almost call it this nonsensical plot begin to unfold. Um, over the the first you know half of this particular still uh, this particular film, that's the thing. They have never really been able to capture you know sexy research in terms of sexy investigation the way they did in the first movie. I don't think. I think uh, Michael uh, Bloomquist is at his least interesting, which is fine because there are other more interesting characters to step in uh, in, in this uh, film. And I think in particular, Erica is is another strong character. And I think we have some great moments where she's, uh, she's really kind of uh, portraying the finesse of fear that comes from being stalked. Uh, I, I think there's some great stuff going on. The, the office dynamics are, are really cool uh, and, and fun to watch sort of unfold as they move toward the publication of this, uh, you know, epic narrative uh in in their magazine i uh i and i i love that we see lisbeth uh orchestrating as much as she can of her own investigation from the hospital bed i thought that was really cool Uh, but ultimately this movie didn't i i walked away from this movie thinking wow they could have i can see why they lopped off uh, a bunch of it to shorten it. I don't even remember the theatrical tra- theatrical version version anymore. But it, this felt like it could have been, you know, a, a solid ninety minutes, <laughs> and it was really just the second half of the movie. Compress the heck out of the uh, out of the opening investigation and give me the good stuff. I, I have to jump back real quick to your sexy research comment and just say, um, "Plague in the hotel lobby." <laughs> There's nothing. <laughs> sexier than watching plague do research <laughs> i hear you i hear what you tried to do there but i'm gonna rain on that parade andy i'm gonna rain plague, yeah. <laughs> plague? that just all i could say is that just made you look weird <laughs> it's it's you know funny <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. No, it, it's actually, you have a point. I get it. In, in context of what he's actually looking at, it's actually yeah. a horrible. Comment it's horrifying. To me. Yeah, it's right. really could potentially paint me in horrible light. In, in fact, uh, let's just go ahead and say this for the record. Please don't <laughs> seek out that sequence. Let's just pretend it went by and you didn't even hear it. It is no commentary it, on Andy. There is the kind nothing of internet sexy he serves. about. <laughs> That research team. We're talking oh, only about goodness. Plague the Man. That's all we're talking about. Pla- Andy thinks Plague the Man is sexy. Please step away from your screens. I'm trying oh, to save yes. you, man. You did this. You put us both in a weird place. Uh, yes, and it's only getting weirder. <laughs> Tell you what, let's move on. I'm going to push this, <laughs> this trolley right up the mountain. There we go. Let's do it. So I, but like you, um, I don't remember what was added to extend this to the much longer version that we had here, this this um, double TV version, essentially. But I don't know. For me, I enjoyed the, the interesting characters that we get. I enjoyed... Um, I particularly enjoyed uh, Lisbeth's doctor. I think that he's just a a great little um, bit of just a kindness that she finds yeah. um, in just this stranger who just is like, you know, I, I see a troubled person and I'm going to help you even though I have no idea what your story is. I just think that's really interesting. And I like the way that that plays out. Um, yeah, so for me, I, I guess I don't know how often I'd go back to watch the whole thing. Um, and maybe that's telling. Um, but I, I wasn't bored by it. You actually ask a question in the notes that I think we need to ask specifically. Does that because this is a movie where these things were were shot back to back, the second and third, uh, they roll from one to the other. Does it make the previous film feel like less of a complete story? And is there a problem with that? That's a that is a um, something that really struck me as I watched this, and I saw that. I mean, this essentially, like you said, starts right as. Uh, the second film ends. I mean, Lisbeth is rescued from uh, the farm where she had just been shot. And the third film starts with, her, uh, you know, the helicopter landing at the hospital. I mean, that's basically how things kick off. Um, 
very much kind of like the other trilogies where the second and third films have really been tied together, like Back to the Future or The Matrix. This one, it really is like this, this, um, it's, it's a complete story across the second and third films. Does that make it really awkward? Um, and it's, a, it's a funny question to ask now in context of all of these, you know, um, uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part one, part two. Yeah. Uh, Hunger Games, uh, whatever the third book's called, Catching Fire, or Part One, Part Two. It, you know, it's like it's it is they're they're doing this more and more where they're taking a big story and they're cutting it in half, um, and oftentimes it just it leaves you like, oh gosh, I, I'm not getting a complete story here. I'm only getting half a half a tale, um, and then I have to come back and watch the other half. And I, this is one case where I really kind of felt that I don't know I was torn because back to the future works pretty well because the second film um, is really set up in the future the third film is really set up in the old west it's one big journey that Marty is on but it does feel like kind of um, two separate stories that they just happen to film back to back Yeah, it's like a um, serial it, yeah exactly this one it is really one story about Lisbeth but when you step back and look at it from the millennium side of things and the basic mysteries that we have in this quote trilogy the first one you have this kind of detective story as they're trying to solve this old case about a missing woman the second one is this detective story trying to figure out who's behind this illegal sex trade that's going on in Sweden and the third one is this detective story trying to uncover this government cover up involving this protection for this uh, foreign crime boss from Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, it just so happens that Lizbeth is really tied into um, that particular story, and that foreign crime boss is the one who's behind that illegal sex trade that they're working on in the second one. Um, so it, I don't know. I feel like there is a that serial element between these two, but they it just so happens that everything got tied together, and so it does turn it into this big massive story that um, does at times feel a little convoluted and, um, you know, it's it just, it feels a little weird kind of the way that it's spread across these two films. It feels like one big movie. And it, it, to that end, watching the extended versions as basically four big episodes actually worked better for me. In particular, the second and third movie. Like, it, it feels like a consistent narrative. I think the first movie just is an absolute standout. And if you don't approach the second two from the perspective of just deep, uh, um, you know, curiosity and love for Salander and Bloomquist, uh, then you're not going to care because it, it's more of a James Bond style continuation, right? Same characters in a completely new story. Uh, where we learn more about the personal lives and their background a little bit sort of doled out. But the the A story, the B story, these are the stories that are are unique to, um, you know, the, the, the second movie that are not, they don't carry, I mean, we don't hear anything about Vennerstrom, we don't hear anything about the Vangers chaos. We, I mean, it's all gone. It's all gone. And none of that is... Uh, added to the resolution in in the the final film and and in that respect it doesn't work very well as a trilogy it's a it is a it's the millennium set uh you know where you have one movie and then one giant movie and we get s- crossover characters but it's a different story and i've i've always had a problem with it as a trilogy it's it presented well, as such it, exactly it, and i think to that end that's a real downside to uh, the way that everything played out with uh, Stieg Larsson, the fact that um, that he had written these three books um, before he uh, died suddenly. Yes. And um, and uh, but he never intended it as a trilogy. He intended it as the Millennium Series. And I think he you know, I, I think he had like something like 10 books lined up as far as what he 10 stories that he was going to build into this uh, millennium series um i and i know you know that we've talked about a few of these other ideas that are part of it and how, how they have since brought in another writer to to finish uh, from his notes uh, like the the girl who I can't remember what they are something with the got, girl, uh, the girl in the spider's, spider's web, web and the girl with the eye for an girl eye girl who thing, takes yeah, an eye for an eye, an eye yeah. for an eye. 
Um, so, so those books are out there now, um, based on those notes. And that makes more sense to me because it really is not a trilogy. And I, I think that's something that, um, just really got, uh, became an unfortunate element the way that, um, it was packaged because of his death, because there were only these three books, because the second and third really are tied together. All of a sudden it just became this idea of this being a trilogy and it's just not. And I think that's a very frustrating element of what we have here. Yeah, I think so too. The the story itself, I it is is fine. It, it's the investigation. You already pointed it out. We're trying to, uh, um, you know, unravel a government cover up. The government part, the sector part, I always struggled with in in this film, I think. My memory of it was that it was convoluted and chaotic, and I could never, uh, like, I never, I just never put my finger on why I was supposed to care that these guys, these old guys were coming out of the woodwork to try and protect some secret that I feel like they were never very good at communicating why they were so scared. Like, you know, the guy's coming out of retirement, he's on dialysis two days a week, like, why is he taking over and trying to kill all these people they just didn't make a very clean case for why they should be feared it it it, it just never felt really uh, substantive to me you mean that what they were covering up right well it's the fact that the government was essentially um you know hiding this this crime boss who was running an illegal sex trade um, bringing Russian girls in as, uh, you know, uh, illegally to just kind of keep them as as basic hostages uh, for the sex trade. And they brought him in for uh, not for that particular reason. They brought him in because he was defecting from Russia. And I think they were looking for government secrets or something. But that's what he was doing. And then they kind of got themselves into a situation where they couldn't get out of it. And they had to hide the fact that they were basically protecting this guy. Well, see, now you've explained it very well, and I knew that. I'm saying the movie didn't do a good job of presenting it. And, and and in fact, you left one element out, which is that, in fact, they were mostly scared of the fact that they lost him for so long and that they brought him over and then they kept such good secrets from, from one another and never wrote anything down and then lost him. And I think that was a, a signature element to the the uh, the sort of Three Stooges narrative of the government uh, side that uh, I, I think was is really important to the story. But all of this comes out at the very end of the movie, right? When you have the, the reportage that comes out as they start talking about, you know, where they were, they were holed up in this apartment and they were, um, you know, they, they had this, uh, this whole network of people that were all under this unofficial cover and they had all these, you know, these people that were working for them that were in the crime circuit and all of that comes out in the last five minutes of the movie. And, I think that makes that doesn't uh, excuse the initial sort of hour and a half of these guys bumbling around trying to trying to off Mikael and Erica and put an end to the Millennium thing. I, I can see your point. I guess I thought there was something really fascinating about this group of these old conspirators and like old assassins that you don't ever see. Like there are always these young guys who are doing all these things. And here you have these, you know, uh, octogenarians who are out there, uh, like the, the old guy who, who kills, uh, uh Zala in his hospital bed. And then takes his own life. And, uh, you know, it just, it's, it was just, I don't know why it struck me as kind of comedic that you have this, this old group that is doing this. And I found that actually quite fascinating that here you have this really, uh, this ancient group of, of people still hiding their secrets and they, they won't let go when, you know, it just, it's, it's, in the past now and it's you know i i don't know i just thought it was a really interesting element <laughs> you know okay i totally get your point and i should i should let it go at that especially because when you bring up comedy i mean you have to admit they're really bad at it like they're really bad <laughs> at what they're doing <laughs> just everywhere they turn it it, it fails and it, by the end when they hire the <laughs> these crime brothers from the yeah, right. serbian <laughs> Go to completely destroy a restaurant and fail, uh, and and it cuts back to these two guys watching TV in their apartment, and and they're like, "How did I know? Zoinks! How did we know? How were we supposed to know they were Serbian crime lords?" It's oh, awesome. That was pretty funny. It was it was very yeah. funny. I totally I mean, get I, that. I don't. 
I don't think that's where the film is aiming for. They didn't want to seem like, you know, it's kind of this comedic thing. But I, I don't know. It just, it does have this this kind of sense of, of comedy to it that, I don't know, made it made it work for me in a weird way. All right, I hear you. I'll let it pass. <laughs> I'll let it pass. I But in context, though, of kind of an actual, like, effective uh, crime thriller, the fact that, you know, I do find it kind of funny, I wonder if that does actually diminish the quality of what they are trying to set up here. And that, I, you know, I mean, maybe that just goes back to uh, Stieg Larsson and his source material. Yeah, I, you know, I wonder, as it, as you go through the narrative of these two movies, when does the story start to fall apart for you? Like, at some point, it gets weaker. When is that? It's, yeah, I mean, I I I feel like it, uh, I mean, it really is kind of the introduction of these people. What's interesting about them is at first, when you have a few people talking about it and, and the fact that, uh, you know, Zala is not going to shut up, we're going to have to do something, and then you get the one who kills Zala, that's all pretty interesting. Uh, but I think maybe it's when it's like, oh, it's this whole organization, they're holed up in this apartment complex, they have this whole, um, this whole, you know, group that is still meeting together to do this work that's probably when it starts to become a little much wouldn't you think i do and it it, it strikes me as a uh, a narrative solution right uh, it's a it's a strategy to write yourself out of a hole and that which is to you know you you run up against a wall with your existing characters so you introduce more characters and that's what it felt like to me. Like at some point, they, you know, even if we, even if we exist in a plane where uh, the daughter hits the father in the head and shoulder with an axe, and then she is shot three times, and then she is buried alive, and then she crawls her way out of the dirt, even if you believe that is credible. Let's just say that is okay. That's table stakes. At some point, it felt like the writer got to the point where he said, I don't know how to explain this anymore. I don't know how to uh, wrap my head around it, so I'm going to introduce a shady organization, and they're going to grow, and it becomes a hydra. And we don't know what to do with it, and it's just chaos. It it just becomes character chaos, and that's what this felt like to me. And it it took what was already a, a really dark thriller, and it it made it just as you said. I think probably correctly, it made it comedic. And it's funny because I, I by the time I get to the end of it, tell I me do though, tell of, me you know what I'm talking about, right? Doesn't it feel oh, a little I totally bit like it, that? Yeah. Right. No, I, I completely agree. It's funny because I, by the time I get to the end of it, I really, you can see, you know, this one kind of uh, went off the deep end. Like, they, you know, Stieg Larsson really decided to kind of just go all, you know, whole hog with his kind of craziness here. He seems to have fallen off the, the bandwagon of the men who hate women. And now it's just like, uh, you know, uh, it's just this this kind of the giant mess of people who you know hate everybody. Everybody hates and everybody, it, <laughs> and it's it, it's just a really kind of confusing uh, story that he ends up with here. I weirdly still find it enjoyable, like watching how everything unfolds by the time we get to the end of this one. But it is pretty messy. It's and, really and messy. That and that yeah, that comedic element uh, you know can be harmful. What do you think? I, I mean, really, you, you you could sit down with Steve Larson and you're looking across from him and you're sipping your tea and he's sipping his tea and and you look at him and you you ask him, uh, Steve, what do you have against psychotherapists? What do you think he would say? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, uh, good old Teleborian. Um, I, I, that's a pretty funny question. That just leads to the comedy of everything. But it's I think a lot of it is just Steve's like men who hate women thing the whole the it it falls to that a lot where it's just like okay so let's who else can be a foil in lisbeth's life let's just yeah. kind of keep piling it on and it really kind of goes down that that dark road where it's you know this guy i mean i i you almost get to a point where you're expecting that teleborian is also doing crazy experiments on lisbeth and she actually does have superpowers because of something that he did to her all of the nonsense of the men in this movie uh that that i don't like uh the women 
I, I think are generally pretty awesome, right? All, all the way from the, the you know, um, uh, we were introduced to Monica Figueroa and we have uh, Sonia Modig, uh, who are on the investigative team. Uh, I like both of them a lot. We don't see much of them, but I but I really like them. We also have what's her name? The the we're going to be talking more about her. We have uh, Annika Hallen as Annika Giannini, the attorney. We get to see much more of her at this point in the in the story, and I think she is great. So here, you know, all of the support structures for uh, Lizbeth are the strongest you know, characters in the, in the story, and they all happen to be women. And that's really gratifying to see, especially when you get up to the end of the film, and you see her again, fully realized in all of her, you know, she's got the whole peacock thing going on. And I think it's just, that's her ultimately, you know, that's, <laughs> that's Daredevil getting his suit, you know, that's Superman donning the cape, right? I, I mean, I just feel like, like, that's, that's what I've been waiting for. So as nonsense as the rest of the film might be, that is enormously rewarding uh, as we get to the end of, of the second half of this movie, which I thought was much better. Yeah, the, the women are strong. I mean, you even right down to the, the policewoman who kind of takes her in, uh, that wonderful moment where you have uh, Lizbeth kind of taking her mask off where she's kind of washing her face, which I thought was just a nice moment for us to have where we get to kind of see her taking the wall down. But then the officer is just like, hey, can I get you anything? It's just like those yeah. little moments between them. I, I really enjoyed all of that. Uh, and I think that they they did develop the, the women really nicely throughout this film. I mean, and, and you didn't mention Lena Andre as Erica. I mean, yeah. she's uh, her, the the frustrations she goes through as she's dealing with um, this potential stalker. I mean, it's it's handled really nicely. And I like all of that throughout the film. It's just, it's really good stuff. Isn't it interesting, though, that Erica is is the one woman in the, the story that, I, I, at least maybe, I hope I'm not speaking out of, uh, out of uh, ill memory, but isn't that she's the one woman in the story that gives up, right? I mean, she's she's the one who calls off the presses and says, no, 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 we can't do that. But that was, for me, that was another, she calls off the presses, but I think, for in my mind, I think that she was being um, smart and compassionate and, and paying attention to, like, the potential danger in people's lives. I mean, they the were physically and, being threatened. Yeah. And and I liked that. And I, I was on her side as far as what Mikhail was doing, how he was, like, you know, basically he went ahead and, and printed the magazine anyway. Um and I mean, sure, I can I can see, and that was that was a resolution that I was really uh, dissatisfied with in this film is that uh, that part of the story where you have this you know this horrifying thing where people are being stalked and and uh, you know they're having things thrown through their windows. Uh, Mikhail's having uh, drugs uh, hidden in his apartment. I mean, there's, there's a lot of like evil stuff happening with these guys, and and here you have um, uh, her. Uh, uh, Erica saying, you know what, we have to stop. We, you know, we've, we've hit the, hit the wall here. And Mikhail's just like, no, we're going to keep doing it. And he prints it anyway. Um, and then the resolution of their relationship, she kind of says, I, I'm leaving and I don't know if I'm going to come back. And then at the end, you know, he, she walks in and they smile and they hug. And I'm like, I, I'm dissatisfied. Like, that's not, there needed to be some other resolution between them. This, this didn't work for me. Yeah, I totally agree. Compare and contrast his his role in this film to his role in Dragon Tattoo, right? In Dragon Tattoo, he was, you know, we we may argue back and forth about whether or not he's a, the savvy journalist, but he was always really on top of it, right? He you never got the feeling that he was, you know, three or four steps behind or he was making doofish decisions. And in this movie, it was like every turn, I was like, "Ugh, that is I I just can't rationalize with him as a character why he would do this right now. I cannot wrap my head around why this idiot is so blind to the needs of his staff. I cannot rationalize why he's such an idiot to, what was his name, Crispin, uh, the other uh, reporter in there. That was an unreal... Christer. Christer. Uh, Crisper? Crister? Crisper. Crister. He's a Chris. <laughs> Crister. Crisper. <laughs> I cannot rationalize how he is so oblivious to that relationship. And maybe there's a good reason for him to be oblivious, but that never played out on stay on screen. And in a three hour film, 
when you're going to have hints of, of his ignorance to the needs of his uh, office, you, you got to kind of play that out. It, going back to the original title of the books, Millennium. I mean, this is the Millennium series, right? And uh, and Millennium as the magazine that's doing this expose, you know, really needed to kind of have a little bit more of that. And I agree, like the relationships that that uh, Mikhail had with his staff um, just does get very frustrating uh, to the point where we stop seeing them. I mean, yeah. after after the threats, uh, you know, Erica is just like, you know, they can't come into work anymore because, uh, you know, it's getting too dangerous. And that's like the the last you see. And it, it feels a little feels a little flat. Like, I feel like there should have been some more uh, for us in uh, in all of that. Well, especially because, I mean, you have such great characters there and such great performances. Oh, yeah. I thought Malin was particularly great. I, I loved seeing her on screen every time she was like involved. And she was such an ancillary character. And I think they, they just had a, a lot of, uh, they had a rich resource in the Millennium Office that I don't think was, was played out. Yeah, yeah I agree. Let's talk about the end, because the end, we have the resolution of the trial, which is kind of the big peak, the climax of the film. But then there's another climax. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it's, it is how the book plays out. Um, it's just, it's one of those, uh, you know, things that people don't have an issue with when you're reading the novel. But it's sort of the same as like the hobbits have to go back to the Shire. Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, yeah. There are things that have to happen, and there's no way that Niederman can be resolved while Lisbeth is in prison. She has to, the re, court, re, courtroom resolution has to happen in order for Niederman's resolution to, to finally play out true and unfortunately in you know it just it does feel like things are slowing down because she gets out of jail and then you still have you know good 15 minutes of the movie or whatever it is and she learns she's got all this property that she inherited from her father and blah 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 and she's got this weird you know brickyard that you know she's like well what is this and so she goes to explore it and of course that's where niederman is hiding <laughs> Look at out. my weird brickyard <laughs> yeah yeah, that was that was awesome. What was he using a brickyard for? I anyway. well, it's one of those things. Like he's some rich foreign guy who has all this property. I mean, it was, she because what did what did uh, uh, Annika said is like one hundred fifty thousand dollars at least just yeah, in the property right. or something. So so uh, she goes to the brickyard and she finds him, and they have one of the most sort of anemic fights. Also because you know he's Niederman is not uh, like. He's kind of oafish, and he was scary when it was dark. And now he's just kind of an oaf lumbering around the place and smashing things. And I kind of got it. There was nothing really unique in this, uh, in the resolution of this particular fight. Uh, she does end up stapling him or nailing him to the to the deck, and then she calls the the uh, you know motorcycle gang, and then she calls the police, and it everybody cascades on one another, and Niederman ends up dead. But I, you know, that they, they sure tied it up in a nice tidy bow, um, and and I find myself fr- frustrated. In context of storytelling, you know, you want your antagonist to kind of take care of things, and yes, I guess she does. Or, I mean, your protagonist to take care of things. She does take care of it in kind of a, a way that is clever. You know, it works as far as this layering of she gets rid of Niederman by bringing in the biker gang. She gets rid of the biker gang by bringing in the police. It all worked out. Uh, for her, as far as what she needed to kind of close up uh, shop, but didn't with. it feel rushed to you? It it didn't feel rushed, um, but it just felt um, uh, just kind of flat. I yeah. think that was the the issue that I had with it is by the time we get to her confrontation with Niederman, like you said, he's kind of oafish. He's slow. He's not much as far as kind of the big chase. I mean, when he when he. Uh, shows up and like the big reveal that here he is uh it's it i don't know it was one of those things where okay okay this could be interesting you know because you get it's one of those things where she's poking around like what's going on then all of a sudden something turns on in the other room or whatever happened like that hook starts moving and so she goes in there and she's looking around like what's happening and then you get that reveal of him kind of stepping out of the shadows from behind her but but then it's like you know it's 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 almost like those those spoof movies where the uh, when they're spoofing a horror movie and the bad guy is always walking slowly in pursuit of the 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 young virgin yes. and the virgin is running through the forest but every time you cut you know he's always right behind her it's like that is exactly what it is like that's exactly <laughs> really 
what it is. It is a lampoon of and it's 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 a lampoon of himself. This is Niederman lampooning early Niederman Niederman. And I found that just I it's it's unsatisfying. The stapling thing I thought was, uh, you know, particularly comedic. Well, especially because she's doing it and it's just like he just looks at her and it's like yeah. he's not trying to grab her or anything. I mean, he's right there. She's right, you know, between his legs and hammer and nailing him to the floor. I appreciate the way that it plays out, but it also just is uh, a little bit underwhelming. Agreed. All right, let's yeah. do the deep scene dive, Andy. Let's do it. This is the takedown of Teleborian. Now, in the second half of the movie, we spend, I don't know, what, what would you say, the, the entire courtroom uh, experience is roughly what a half hour, forty minutes. Yeah, I think I think it starts about forty minutes before the movie ends. Yeah, and so we've and got, then it ends about fifteen minutes before the movie ends. So it's yeah, it's probably about a half hour. Yeah, I think it's about a half hour. And so we've got uh, we've got some time where the defense is, um, you know, she's making her case and she's not doing very well, predictably. And then we have the um, uh, the the attorney uh, for the state is, uh, you know, trying to get trying to build the case and she he's working hard to build a case that Teleborian is his expert witness that Teleborian has now written the definitive psychological report on her state that she is not well that she needs to be remanded back into uh, the custody uh, of his hospital uh, and locked away forever and ever amen and yeah. leading up to this we know that that uh, uh, Mikhail has unearthed some additional uh, uh, juicy, nasty stuff. Sexy, sexy plague. Sexy plague. And did you like that? I had never. Uh, so he he says uh, uh, in Swedish, 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 nasty. Sh- <laughs> I, I did like that. that. I thought that was great. I had to stop and play that for my wife because I did not know. I I can't wait for our Swedish friends to comment on that because I. I feel like there should be a way to say that in Swedish. When it's really serious, when Pete, it, you say it in you English. You say it in English. <laughs> right? I thought that was really good. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, where are we in the deep scene dive? Why is this the, the scene we chose? Uh, well, I think we chose this because it's just a... Um, I mean, it is a very satisfying resolution, despite some of the issues that you may have with the film. I mean, Teleborian is pretty much set up as just this horrible, horrible figure in Lisbeth's life. He tortured her when she was a kid. You know, he left her strapped to the bed like, uh, you know, uh, over a year or whatever it was. Yeah. Just like, I mean, he's just a terrible person. And he's got just, the, uh, it has to be the all-time slimiest line um, said in in a movie. You know, he's got, you never understood that touching can be a part of the treatment. Oh. I mean, that's just, it's so creepy to hear that coming out of his mouth. Uh, and, and so it just, it just makes you sick. And so you, you see this scene uh, as it plays out as basically first, it, it kicks off with uh, Mikhail kind of giving his testimony about the paperwork, like, oh, this was him. You know, he had written this basically before he had even done his interview with Lisbeth. And so, you know, he shot himself in the foot in that aspect. But then they bring in uh, the uh, the I don't know what his role is, but he's Chief Ed Ed Clint, the um, uh, Nicholas Falk playing the role. Um, he is the one who's kind of the the head of the government organization that's now trying to kind of I, I don't know it's almost was, like the, yeah I saw him as like internal uh, affairs yeah exactly I was gonna say yeah. he's kind of like internal affairs for the government um, and um, he is testifying and he brings up all this stuff about um, this secret organization the the you know the specter of our film um, and uh, and and the fact that uh, Teleborian is tied into it. And then, of course, he brings up the fact that Teleborian also has he's under arrest because he has a lot of child porn on his computer, which, you know, makes sense considering just the awful stuff that he had done with Lisbeth when she was little and why he wants to kind of keep her uh, kind of uh, locked up. And uh, it leads to his arrest. I mean, it just it's it's a great moment um, as as you get to watch this this horrible character kind of go under. And so I think that's largely why we picked it and talked about it. I think so, too. And, and you know, we did get to see them, you know, his first uh, um, first 
uh, what's the word? It's not betrayal, but his first shock, realizing that they have more than than you know he thought, is actually legitimate shock. That in fact he really didn't believe that the the rape story, uh, the Bierman uh, rape story, until they saw that DVD and things start to unravel from there. And watching them watch that DVD in the courtroom is incredibly satisfying because that's when Teleborian uh, starts doing this thing, uh, you know, this eyes closed thing, you know, and oh, Anders, Anders Album is, uh, plays the, the character of Teleborian. And it is, it, it's great. It is great. The way he withers is, it's just expert withering. Uh, he's a terrible, <laughs> terrible person and he plays it so well. Maybe not quite as well as as Bierman at playing the worst, but easily <laughs> up there. Well, yeah, they're both pretty pretty bad. Yeah, and after what they found on the computer, you know, I wouldn't put it past Teleborian for having uh, done his own bit of uh, right. Biermaning with uh, Lisbeth when he <laughs> had her right. locked up. He went full Bierman. <laughs> he went full Bierman. It's terrible. It's humanity yeah, is awful. <laughs> it's just terrible stuff. And also, speaking of uh, Teleborian and how great he is at withering, I love watching Ekstrom and how he really withers because he's watching his entire case fade away. And he's just, it's almost like he's getting physically ill as he's just, as all of this comes to light and, and he's sitting next to Teleborian and you almost see the look in his eye like, can I just go sit on your side of the yeah. room now? <laughs> you, know? you know, it that is, that's absolutely right. Because what you have this extra layer in, um, this is Niklas Hulström as a prosecutor Ekstrom, the extra layer we get with him is that he's not only withering because his case is unraveling, but he's withering because he was wrong. And yeah, he right. backed the wrong horse. The, all along, he backed the wrong horse. And I think that that's a really important extra element. And I think that makes it that much harder to portray on screen, you know, in, in his to his credit. It's it's to, to be able to deliver that sort of complex reaction uh, when all you're doing is sitting at a desk is uh, it was, it's pretty special performance. My recollection of uh, the way things are in the book is that he actually has a little bit more of an ending because when when the trial, when all of this comes to light and everything, I think he actually withdraws the charges. And that felt a little more conclusive to me. Yep. The way that the, the film ends it is the judge says, okay, we're going to... Um, postpone this Lisbeth you're free while we figure out what the charges are going to be or whatever it's I can't remember what it is but something like that and and in the book it's just like no we're actually going to withdraw all charges that makes so much more sense and I don't know why they I mean that's a small uh it, it wouldn't have taken any time because it, it's all still there so I don't know why they changed that you know it's interesting because what we have in the movie we and I thought this was odd they they make a a point of showing him before the the judge and panel come back uh they show him you know putting all his papers away in his briefcase like he he's they're they're telegraphing that you know we he knows he's done he knows this is over yeah, right and then the judge, you know, reads the case, their their pronouncement. Uh, then they, I love how she says it. That we don't even we haven't even started like parsing all of this stuff. Like there's no way we could figure out all the stuff you presented to us. But one thing we do know is that Elizabeth Salander should go free uh, for now, pending sentencing. And then Ekstrom just leaves, and that is not. And he leaves kind of huffy, and I find that really. Uh, it's it's limiting to the character after we had uh, such a, a really strong portrayal during the actual, like during the meat of the sequence. I wanted him to show more, to communicate more to, you know, Giannini and to Salander that, you know, we got it. The law is on your side because he's the law guy. Well, and, and there were so many elements that they could have done because he's the guy who took um, Bublonsky off the case earlier in the film right and gave it to the other idiot uh that we all hated so much in yeah. the in the last film and then to see bublonsky and uh and and modig walking in together to confiscate uh uh teleborian's laptop and stuff like there's i don't think there was even really a good reaction shot of him going wait a minute why are these guys working with this government chief you know i had i had kind of 
taken them off the case. And here they are all of a sudden working with the with the government to to do all this. Like there's yeah. no good reaction to him. Like what the, what's going on? Yeah. Um. And and so yeah, there were there were moments that they could have added in here to really kind of flesh that out because it is a really interesting story. Like his thread here, and I just feel like it gets diminished quite a bit. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, Numi, you know, just a, a final comment on Numi. I think this is this is the scene to watch uh, for her because we get this final uh, ideological realization of who she is. Right? I mean, she's in full character. She's in the makeup. She's got all the the silver on her, uh, and we get this little smile. And and we get this little smile uh, throughout the the courtroom sequence, but uh, the smile that indicates, you know, she knows that she has taken control again, and I love this as the superheroine who now understands that she can subvert this ill male authority across context, not just with a tattoo, a giant tattoo needle uh, in a darkened room with a guy, you know, tied up on the floor, uh, not only through violence, but now through the law. And I think that's a that's a really cool transformation to see her at the end of, you know, this nine hour uh, epic engagement with her. Yeah, it really is. She's she's fantastic. Uh, you know, credits to uh, Jenny Fred, who was working hair and makeup, and uh, Sila Rorby, uh, who worked on the costumes, yeah. because uh, she really does have, like, the ultimate badass super heroine look going on here. Kind of that goth punk, um, you know, I can I can destroy the world sort yeah, of right. vibe. I mean, she's great here. And you're right, those little smiles that she gives as she's watching the takedown play out. That says so much in those little moments. Camera again by Peter Mokrosinski. Uh, you know, he, he had an interesting challenge with this sequence. The courtroom is an interesting kind of stage. It is, it, it's so naturally proscenium. And with the wide shot, uh, we have the two arms coming out toward us. We have the back of the, uh, you know, whoever is being questioned kind of in the middle of the thing. And then we have high up on the bench, we have the, the judge and panel uh, in the back. And, uh, you know, what did you think of, of how they managed the camera? Was it interesting? It felt very uh, straightforward in the courtroom for the most part. You know, you have just the, um, uh, you have the the medium shot of the person doing the testifying. And then from that same position, you kind of have the uh, the reverses of whether it's Teleborian or Ekstrom or the two shot or the other side of the room. Uh, or the judge. I mean, it's very much like the camera's right in between all of them, and we're just going to kind of move it around and point it at people. It's nothing too fancy, I don't think. Um, it gets a little more interesting maybe when uh, when we're dealing with people getting taken away by police, whether it's the uh, the old man uh, in, in bed who's getting his, because uh, we have that cutaway to him as he's uh, in his dialysis and the police come to arrest him and it's a little more handheld um steady cam as they're kind of moving around and stuff so i mean it's it's nothing too um overtly crazy in in context of like this these dark chambers where you've got the people lit nicely and the walls behind them just like dropping into blackness mm -hmm. it really does kind of emphasize kind of just the intensity of of what's going on despite the fact that the camera's not really dancing yeah. around it was workmanlike. Like, it was workmanlike. It was yes. workmanlike. Yeah. I, you know, you we've mentioned Annika Hallen as uh, playing Annika Giannini as um, Mikhail's sister uh, and uh, Lisbeth's lawyer. I just think that it's it's great seeing her really kind of. She's been in the whole trilogy, but in kind of slowly uh, growing parts, and and here she gets just a much bigger part, and we get to really enjoy what she brings to the table here. And as she's kind of running this, she's not quite, um, uh, most of this is just listening to her two witnesses talk, but just seeing the reactions on her face as she's finally realizing, um, I might actually be able to win this here. And I, I think that's great in what she does here. We've got a new, uh, a new pen uh, doing the adaptation, Ulf Ryberg. Yes, we do. A, a new pen. 
I, I, I'm not sure exactly why they had different writers splitting the whole thing up. I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, direction that they did. I don't know. It Maybe it's just, just it's, sort of pedestrian, kind of pr- practical, because they were moving quickly, you know? I think that's exactly it. I mean, they had very small budgets, as we've said. So, yeah. And they were shooting them back to back. So I think they had to have somebody coming in and just kind of plowing through these massive stories and just to kind of condensing it into something they could shoot. But we do have uh, Daniel Alfredson, and I, I have not a whole lot to add about Daniel Alfredson as the director, because this feels like uh, of a piece with the movie that it immediately preceded it. So, um, you know, Ibid. I I will say, um, jumping back to the writer real quick, because I, you're right, I don't really have much to say about Daniel Alfredson. I think that we didn't say last week. Um, but Ulf Ryberg did also adapt the novel Headhunters, which I think is such an incredible film. It's such a great adaptation um, that it's a movie well worth checking out. And um, it, it's interesting because I think that one worked so well. And here we have this one that doesn't feel, again, it just boils down to the source material. I think it just, it doesn't feel as strong. And, you know, it's just, it's the nature of the beast, I guess. But Morton Tildum, how did I miss that? I don't know, but you need to watch it. I do. I really it's do. It's so good. It's so good. Oh, man. Yeah. Anybody else in the cast that you want to talk about? I The only two that I really just want to shout out again, uh, Monica Figueroa is played by Mirja Turistet and Sonia Modig is uh, Tanya Lorenzson. And I just think they round out uh, and soften the, e- even though they are strong characters in here and we see them in action, I, I think they round out the um, ultimate sort of perce- perception of lawlessness in the police force. They're, it's in such chaos. It is, they mistrust what we know to be true in the story and these women sort of uh, are are you know sort of moral uh, a moral compass uh, for the police force and I, I appreciate what they did here yeah I definitely agree the only other person I was gonna bring up was uh, Per Oskarsson who plays um, her former uh, ward Holger Palmgren the one who had had a stroke in the first film and um, here we just get a nice little bit of her kind of taking care of him at the end, which is nice. Uh, I like that. But this is sadly his last film. I mean, he had been working in uh, films for decades. And uh, and here it's just, it's very sad that uh, just shortly after, it was about a year after the film was released, um, he and his wife died in a house fire. So it's a kind of tragic, tragic end, yeah. Uh, we should say Hans Alfredson uh, again is part of the um, the Alfredson uh, industrial complex, performs oh, yes, Swedish yes. industrial complex, and he plays Evan Goldberg in this film, and he is uh, uh, the father of the director Daniel Goldberg. We talked a little bit about that last week. Yes, yes, we did. Yes, we did. You were there. I sure was. How to do an award season? Anything? It wasn't a big award movie. It's they've kind of been slowly diminishing as the series has continued. It did have one win, and three other nominations. The one win was for a Numi Rapace as a breakthrough artist. She won. It was a pair of win, or is a, a win for the two movies, this and the girl who played with fire, being released at the same year um, by the New York Film Critics Online. Uh, just small nominations, nothing very big though, nothing to shout out about. So uh, again, for the kind of conclusion of the this quote unquote trilogy, it really just feels like you know it's just kind of another step down from the other two. And what about uh, you know we talked a little bit about where this fits in the overall sort of remake uh, you know strata. Uh, we don't need to belabor that. But what about in other formats? Uh, graphic novel? Have you read it? I haven't. I actually uh, thought it was kind of interesting to learn that um, DC, uh, its Vertigo uh, brand, had the rights and they were adapting each novel, each of these three novels into two graphic novels um, that uh, were adopted. And uh, gosh, I I think they were released up through 2015, if I recall. So um, I think that's uh, pretty interesting, and it actually, uh, I think they could make some pretty interesting, albeit dark, graphic novels to check out. I'm going to check it out, because there it is. It's on, um, yeah, there it is. The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest on Comixology, coming soon 
The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest, Volume Three, Millennium Volume. Uh, so uh, they've they, it's it's right there. I'm totally checking yeah. that out. Very cool. God, it looks beautiful. Link in the show notes. Check that out. And we've talked about the girl in the spider web. Yeah, the fact that they're they're um, making that it's all set for at this point in October 2018 release, directed by Fede Alvarez uh, and starring Claire Foy. So we'll see if it uh, if it ends up uh, shaking out with that exact date still. Um, I did like to see that uh, Stephen Knight, who we like as a screenwriter, he is actually involved in working on the script adaptation along with Alvarez and Jay Basu. So uh, maybe that means that it's, uh, good things in store. I, I look hope. forward to seeing seeing how it shakes out. Yeah, I hope so. How about the numbers? Well, for Alfredson's conclusion to this trilogy, quote unquote, he got an even still smaller budget than either of the previous two, making this one for $5.3 million or $5.9 million in today's dollars. This film was almost as long as the first film, too, coming in at 147 minutes. The movie opened in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark on November 29, 2009, just a few months after Fire, then hit the U.S. in a limited release October 29, 2010, where Saw 3D was its big competitor. Interesting note, though, Pete, this movie did actually have its premier U.S. release at the Scottsdale International Film Festival October 1st, 2010, right here in the Valley. So You must be so proud. Uh, this film did get the most mixed reviews from critics and audiences and only ended up making $5.4 million domestically and $35.7 million everywhere else, grossing $46.1 million in today's dollars. It was the least profitable of the trilogy and had the lowest adjusted profit per finished minute of $273,000. But it still made its money back and certainly was part of the mark on the world made by Lizbeth Salander. You know, I have to say, as as disappointing ultimately as the whole of this film is, it has some strong elements. It it gives me more of what I wanted out of the entire trilogy, which is more time with these characters. I adore these characters. I really do. Uh, and so I, you know, from the books... Uh, to to the movies, to the American remake of the um, of the Dragon Tattoo, I adore them. I endorse spending time with them and seeing how they exist on screen. And so, uh, I would say, uh, you know, the film ultimately works. It's not it's not terrible. It's frustrating in a lot of interesting ways. And uh, I still uh, ultimately don't hate it. Uh, and I, I really enjoy that we talked about the whole trilogy. I, I do too. I'm really glad that we did. I enjoy Numi just so much, and I'm so glad that she has really grown from this to have just this fantastic career in films all around the world. I think she's a, a just a, a brilliant actress and was a great find for this uh, trilogy. And I have to say, I have grown in my appreciation for uh, Michael Nickvist yeah. in what he was doing here as uh, Mikhail Bloomquist, um, because I, I, I don't know, I just felt like um, he worked really well as this kind of schlubby uh, uh, magazine publisher who just kind of starts digging into these detective stories. I thought that was great, and I really enjoyed watching him on screen and the relationship that he had with uh, Lizbeth. So, I, yeah, it's... It is a problematic film, but I also enjoyed it, and uh, I'm curious to see uh, how it ranks. Let's do it, Andy. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel, and you'll see the, our list of all the movies we've talked about on this show. You can sign up for your own account and uh, start up your own list, and let's see how our rankings appear together. Where do we start? First off, The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest, or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I've got to say Oh Brother. Yeah, it's Oh Brother. The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest or Atlantic City? I'll go with The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest. Oh, uh, yeah. I think I will, too. The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest or Gremlins. Definitely Gremlins for yes, me. Yes, Gremlins. The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest or Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Star Trek Three. Yeah. Sure, why not? Star Trek Three. it is. <laughs> the Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest or The Illusionist. I'm going to say Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest. Is it because of Giamatti? Yes, it's because of the silly cop. Oh, it just I, I can't I can't look at that seriously anymore. I'm sorry, man. Oh, you kids! I will. You uh, got me. I'll give it to uh, I'll give it to Hornets next. 
Oh, the girl who kicked the hornet's nest or village of the damned. Hornet's nest. Hornet's nest, indeed. The girl who kicked the hornet's nest or Gallipoli. Hmm. I think I'm probably hornet's nest. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <That was> committal. <laughs> the girl who kicked the hornet's nest or Lupin the Third, the castle of Cagliostro. Uh, I'm going to be hornet's nest on this. Uh, me too. All right. There it is. The girl who kicked the hornet's nest has landed at 228 on our chart. 228 out of 330. It's not super high, uh, but, you know, it's not at the bottom. So I guess that's saying something. <laughs> you, did, you said exactly something there. <laughs> I did. No more, no um, less. This, what did it do on your individual ranking? Well, before we get to our individual rankings, I thought it would be interesting to look and see how the entire... The entire oeuvre of Stieg Larsson appears on our chart. So the top of our chart is the Swedish adaptation of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, uh, coming in at 167. Then we have the Fincher remake at 221. We have, and see, I don't know if this is right. Uh, I think that somehow things got, uh, uh, fell awry. The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest at 228, and The Girl Who Played with Fire at 271. So what what is awry? What doesn't feel right about that to you? Well, I feel like Played with Fire... Uh, would be higher for me than Hornet's Nest. Yeah, I agree. I don't know how that happened either. And I'm looking at my individual ranking, and I have Girl Who Played with the Dragon Tattoo at 78, then The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest at 328, and then Girl Who Played with Fire at 510. That deserves a re-ranking, uh, because that's that's not where it needs to be. It needs to be between those two. Exactly. Yeah. Something is amiss. Something is amiss. Uh, but I will rectify that right away. According to uh, Flickchart, I should rank this at a three and a half stars over on letterbox.com slash the next reel. And I I think I'm going to do that. Yeah, I, my, I ended up at 12.15 out of 38.85, which is about a 69% uh, for uh, the girl who kicked the hornet's nest. And I've, I've been kind of struggling. Is it three or is it three and a half stars? Um, I feel like I'm at a three star with this one. Um, I, I I think it's interesting, actually, that you rated it higher than I did, and I seemed to have enjoyed it more than you did. But there it sits. Yeah, I you know I'm I'll go with the uh, I'll go with the algorithm. The algorithm says three and a half stars, Andy. Always yes, trust the algorithm. <laughs> Always trust the algorithm. <laughs> So what does that do for us in uh, Letterbox, our collective Letterbox ranking? What does it do? Are you going to siphon away my half star in Letterbox? No, I mean it'll it'll land at three point five. There you go. That's what I want to hear. We're rounding up. Are we going to give it a heart? Yeah, I'm, I'm still giving it a heart. I, I really heart. enjoy it, even with its issues. Yeah, it deserves the heart. Mm-hmm. Plus, it gave us new me. Plus, it gave us new me. Thank you. Although you can argue the first film gave us new me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All of the films gave us new me. Yes. There you go. Crying out loud, Prometheus gave us new me. Ugh. Hey, passion uh, <laughs> gave us new me. Ugh. That's right. Ugh. All right. Well, this is a delight. Where do we go from here? Oh, Pete, it's the holiday season, oh, and we're, we're kicking off. We're kicking off uh, the season with. I, it's a film that I I wouldn't say is a family friendly holiday film, but it certainly is a fun film to watch for the holidays, and it is of course Die Hard. And we will be going through all five films. So kicking off the month of January <laughs> for uh, for five weeks, we're going to be going through the Die Hard series. Fist with your toes, Andy. Fist with your toes. <laughs> You know, you're right. I love it. I love it. I can't wait to visit old Nakatomi. And then when that movie ends, Andy, our conversation begins. Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always do it. Oh, dear. We're wrapping it up with some good ones. Juicy, juicy. Mmm. Some nasty. <laughs> Would you like to go first? I think I should go first. I haven't, I haven't even read yours. I am unspoiled. Uh, I have a one star by LW who says, very sad. Filmed in Sweden, I think, with <laughs> actors no one has ever heard of. 
English is dubbed over, and the words don't match the movement of their mouths. What? V- v- apparently, he watched the dubbed version. I'm shocked. And expects it expects it to line up. Very poor acting. Barely followed the book. Just very sad indeed. Stick with the book and skip this poor excuse for a movie not worth your time or money. Oh, Andy, that is an excellent entree to mine. <laughs> it is exceptional. Uh, mine is uh, by Kindle Customer, who says with a one star, too much violence. And then we learn a little bit about culture. Kindle Customer says, I'm sorry. The Swedes are obviously all depressed, perverted, and incestuous, just like all Americans own guns and belong to gangs. I had no sympathy for any of the characters, and I was tired of the same plot dragged on. They did it again in number three. I'm sickened by the bad government figures. I'm going back to blissful ignorance and Disney movies. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, my. What? Apparently, this person needs to go back and watch The Hunchback of Notre Dame. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Depressed? Check. Perverted? Check. Incestuous? Got it. (laughs) That's a lock. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, again, thank you, Amazon, and sorry, Sweden. It's hard to believe that we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You're telling me producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our originals page when shopping for books and movies we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. I was so excited for our big Star Trek film franchise series this season. All those movies adapted from Gene Roddenberry's original 1960s TV show. As a huge fan, I know that you geeked out over analyzing the adaptations. Absolutely. From the motion picture to the Kelvin timeline films, seeing the Enterprise crews on the big screen was a dream come true. Our list of source material isn't just all books and plays. We have the original series in our list of source material. You can rent the episodes to watch and enjoy and support the show in the process. For our Millennium Trilogy series, we covered films adapted from the original books that launched Lizbeth Salander, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, The Girl Who Played with Fire, and The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest. As much as I love Fincher's version, the original Swedish versions are the way to go. We also did our Die Hard series in Season 7. I can't believe Die Hard and Die Hard 2 were adaptations! Two of the greatest action movies ever. Well, one of them at least. The other is awfully fun, though. We revisited the classic Mary Poppins for our 1960s movie musical series. A spoonful of sugar always helps the medicine go down. Old Boy was intense for our Park Chan-wook Vengeance trilogy. And East of Eden and Giant were highlights of our James Dean series. And a fun time travel mind bender with predestination to cap things off. Find all the books behind these adaptations and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Dive into the source material for your favorite movies. Check it out today. Thenextreel.com slash originals. Originals.